welcome to episode 78 of the Stag Raw. We're back with Dr. Greg Emerson. It was awesome. Um, him and I got to catch up at Newry Bar again at the Harvest there. Absolutely awesome setting if you were in the Byron area, head into the hinterland and go to Newry Bar and get yourself oh, just the best place really and then the food and the coffee on top of that is outstanding. Um, if you go into the restaurant, grab a group of friends and get the um, Dorper lamb shoulder, uh, even from um, a six month old, which Billy was when we were there for it, right the way through to any age, it's absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, in this podcast we talk with Greg about sleep in particular, um, it's pretty massive, especially if you've got a wee one. Uh, a little bit on CBD again, um, his perspective and sort of the Aussie perspective and a little bit into the rules and regulations around that. Um, as he says, if you've met the criteria, it's reasonably easy to get a hold of. Um, and yeah, so it might be a matter of having to educate your doctor around that, but if you are trying to look for that, look for a different way of dealing with um, the chronic pain or maybe epilepsy, as he said, there's a couple of other criteria that he mentions. Um, yeah might be an avenue to, to look at and plenty of amazing research coming out around that area. And yeah, we just have a really good chat about um, what this current lifestyle is doing to us and, and good to think about, good to consider and, and possibly make some changes or adapt um, your lifestyle to better fit what's naturally human. Um, love talking to Greg, he's a great man. Um, and what a setting to record this in. Hope you enjoy. I see plenty of you enjoyed the first time around we talked. If you haven't listened to that yet, just head back down through um, the podcast and you'll find it there. It's been hugely popular. Um, one of the last, most popular, actually the most popular episode in the last six months. So you're well worth checking out. Let's get into it. Cheers. Good everybody. We're sitting back in the most beautiful place in the hinterland. One off. It's a beautiful place overall. Um, harvest back with Dr. Greg Emerson and we're just going to have another conversation and, and hear some of his thoughts. Um, we've been having a bit of a discussion off, off air and we're going to start off with something that I've been looking into a lot, especially being a father of a young child and that's sleep. Um, and Greg was saying that it's number two on his list for anybody with cancer. So what, what are you sort of, why is it so important? Well, it's probably number two on the list for health, really, yeah. not just cancer. Uh, the research now on uh, the, the, not just the benefits of sleep, but the, the requirements for adequate sleep during the right period of time and in accordance with your circadian rhythm uh, is extraordinary. I mean, the guy won the Nobel Prize in medicine last year for his work on circadian rhythms and sleep. So it's, it's, if it's important enough to get a Nobel Prize out of, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's got to be important. And, and I often think about, you know, my, uh, my training in medicine when I was working in emergency departments and doing night shifts. And I remember doing uh, intensive care shifts and in intensive care at Fremantle Hospital in Western Australia, where I would start at six o'clock in the evening. And I would finish at eight, but by the time I did, eight the next morning, but by the time I did the handover, uh, I wouldn't be getting home till, wouldn't be leaving hospital until nine o'clock, driving home. I don't even know how I hear now the number of micro sleeps I had while driving home. So not, not only is sleep important, but the, the fact that we're living lifestyles not according to our circadian rhythms is, is not only long term risky for your health, but short term very risky you know the number of people i know the number of nurses that i speak to have micro sleeps while i'm driving home it's just scary i don't know how there's not more accidents i mean i, I should have had multitude of accidents the number of micro sleeps i had when driving home so of course then you get home and you've got to start you got to get to bed you're getting to bed at 10 in the morning and you've got to get up at four o'clock 4 30 to start getting ready for your shift again that starts at six o'clock so um, and you don't sleep very well during the day because, you know, it's hard to get your room dark and stuff like that. So, you know, what we, it's almost now if you're doing shift work and night shift that not only should you get penalty rates, but you really need to get, you know, um, remunerated for, you know, the risks to your longevity now with what we know about the importance of sleep. 
in transport. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, shift working and night shifts now, you need to get danger money mm. for because of what you're doing to your health. And because uh, well, what we know now about the benefits of sleep is extraordinary. It's not just, you know, let's get some rest so we've got lots of energy t- during the day. It's, it's the time when we know that we clean the brain. It's the garbage collection. Yeah. When we're asleep, melatonin, the sleep hormone, goes through and it cleans the brain. And uh, there's a lot of evidence now that a big component of dementia, and particularly Alzheimer's disease, is just this excessive accumulation of waste products in the brain because uh, people have been missed out on on their sleep from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. when a lot of the garbage cleaning happens. Um, We also know that um, during sleep you have mitogenesis, which is where you start breaking down old mitochondria in the brain. The mitochondria, as we both know, are where you you produce energy uh, for your cells. And during sleep, melatonin, again, not only does it take out the garbage, but it also breaks down old, worn-out mitochondria and rebuilds them into uses those components to rebuild new mitochondria. So you're basically restoring brain, developing new brain in a way by developing new mitochondria when you sleep and all of that is done by melatonin. And melatonin, again, everybody knows about melatonin but I don't think we know how incredibly powerful it is. So yes, it helps us to sleep but it also supervises garbage removal from the brain. It also supervises um, mitogenesis and the repair of damaged mito- mitochondria. It also we're just now evidence that it converts white fat to brown fat, which helps us uh, lose weight. Um, so, and, and it kills cancer cells. Uh, melatonin is a phenomenally anti-cancer agent that uh, helps kill cancer. And we also now know that melatonin comes from serotonin, and serotonin, 90% of our serotonin in our bodies is produced in our gut. So, hello, the new world of gut health being incredibly mm. important for that whole process. Because if you don't have, if you don't have a healthy gut, you don't make enough serotonin. If you don't make enough serotonin, which is probably the most ancient molecule, you know, known to, you know, known to us in terms of effects on the body. If you don't make enough serotonin, you don't make enough melatonin. If you don't make enough melatonin, you're not cleaning out your brain. If you don't make enough melatonin, you're not getting new mitochondria. If you're not making enough melatonin, you're not converting white fat to brown fat. Um, if you're not making enough melatonin, you're um, not breaking down cancer cells. So, you know, and all that goes back to do I have a healthy gut? So this is a fascinating new area of medicine of, of science showing what traditional populations have always known and always practiced in terms of good sleep habits. So yeah, it's getting good sleep is critical for all those processes and having a good gut is critical for getting good sleep and as you know, being an optometrist, you know, being very careful about the light that you put on your eyes uh, is critical for melatonin production uh, and gut health as well. So it all it's this fascinating giant quilt of interweaving fibers, which, even though it sounds complicated, comes back to a few ancient health paradigms that we have done since the dawn of time, which now we've moved away from and suffering the consequences. Mm. And, you know, the parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep and let your gut digest. It's, it's amazing there. Um, and, you know, that stimulating the vagus nerve, whether we breathe, whether we sleep, you know, and then again, are we sleeping properly if we're not breathing properly? <laughs> you know, are we stretching and stimulating that vagus nerve yeah. by breathing through our diaphragm and and resting, or yes. are we in a panic because we're going yep. into our into our chest and short breath and not providing enough oxygen yep. to our brain, you know? Yeah. And so, where, where does where does breathing come into somebody that doesn't sleep? You know, you can do a you can do a sleep study and get the CPAP and, um, you know, life's full of interactions that are just random. But I had a bloke who was an engineer at Fisher and Parkle in the in the sleep um, study there, and that was exactly what he was looking at. How does these people on CPAP, or, or not on CPAP, how are their mitochondrial functioning? And then 
he was he was South African, he knew about Tim Noakes and he was excited about, you know, if we remove carbohydrates from these people, would they have better mitochondria does their sleep improve? And he was going, Hell yeah. <laughs> and you know, it was just one of those moments in time where I was I was speaking to his wife about something to do with energy and mitochondria and oh yeah, that's what we see in the sleep in the sleep study. Yeah. So it's amazing. Um and then, you know, you spoke about medical realm and you know night shifts and all that sort of stuff um and unfortunately when you, if you listen to matthew walker that comes from somebody in in america self using some cocaine and going all night and that's that's the status quo you've got to go all night to, yeah yeah what what's the sort of as a um resident doctor what's the sort of pressure from from mentors <laughs> to to be all on and always there Ah, uh, well, that's not an issue. I mean, you're you're very you have to be very motivated as a young doctor. Yeah. I mean, you're in over your head most of the time, <laughs> so you're always and there's a problem. There's a sleep problem because you're now in fight or flight mode. Yeah. You're in your limbic brain, and I mean the 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 stuff I work now with and the area of stuff that I do for myself, differentiating between you know the limbic brain, the lizard brain, or some people call the tyrant king brain because it's all about <laughs> it's all about um, you know fight, flight, feed, um, and but it's not it's it's very different in its fuel supply and it's very different into its um, uh, objectives in life to the neocortex. And of course, when you're an, uh, uh, you know a young doctor in an emergency department or wherever you find yourself, you're stuck in fight or flight mode constantly. So motivation's not usually an issue, but I suppose what la- what we lack in medicine, I mean, I started, I was telling somebody the other day, I started at medical school when I was 18. Mm-hmm. So I would have been in a, laborat- a, a, a laboratory at the age of 18, chopping up dead bodies, cadavers as part of my anatomy studies. Mm. That's pretty young to be doing that. And at 22, I was... You know, 20, 22, I was working in a hospital in Papua New Guinea, unsupervised. At 23, I was doing night shifts at Nelson Hospital in New Zealand in the emergency department. And, you know, the, I often say to people, during that time that I started from 18 up to where I am now, you know, nearly 30 years later, well, no, over 30 years, yet. <laughs> God, I don't like to say that. <laughs> a freaking long time later, uh, how many times has the system that I've worked for or a senior colleague come up and put his hand on my shoulder and gone, Greg, how are you coping with all this? <laughs> uh, the answer is none. No. Zip nada. So motivation is not a problem for young doctors because you're stuck in fight or flight mode constantly. What is lacking is the, uh, the teaching of, of self-care and you know, from, a, from a mental and physical perspective to help you cope with what you have to go through. That's what is really lacking, and you know, we, we've got you know pumping out these doctors who who work incredibly long hours, but you know they don't know how to look after their brains and their health to cope with the, what we put them through. Um, we don't even know they don't even know what foods to eat. They don't you know we, we're still being taught that fat is bad for us. You know, yet you and I both know that it's it's the lizard brain, it's the tyrant king brain which feeds on sugar. You know, uh, but our neocortex. And of course, you know, you survive in a in a hospital working night shift on sugar, mm. you know, and coffees. Yeah, and coffee, sugar, and coffee is how you get through. Um, you don't you don't know you're not taught that it's you know that it's the avocado and the olive oil and the ghee uh, and the coconut oil, which is what your brain, ne- the, the neocortex of the brain, yeah. needs as a fuel source. Source so. Uh, we're not taught that, and so you're not even getting the right nutrients for your brain. You're not getting the right amount of sleep. Um, so it, you know, we need to review that whole process. Yeah, something you just brought up there is the intrinsic motivation to be a doctor, and it's you know I'm passionate about health and overall you know I, I probably a lot of my patients are quite surprised when I start talking about other areas of of their body and how their body works and. You know, they have dry eyes and they ask why and I say, well, you know, it could be a various number of things, you know, the toxic lifestyle you're exposed to, the amount of sleep you get, what you eat, and they go, well, 
are you talking about the eyes? And it's like, no. And, and I said, well, <laughs> why aren't you a doctor? And I didn't have that intrinsic motivation to spend, you know, seven years at university and then work another, I don't know, 10 years to become a specialist. That, it's not what I, what I wanted to do and wanted to have a full life. But at the same time, as an optometrist, you think, well, maybe I could do more. And I, I guess that's part of why I tried to do this podcast and talk to more people who do do those right. things. Where do you well, think? I mean, the good thing about optometry is that you're an expert in the eye, and the eye is part of the brain, yeah. and the brain's a fairly important organ uh, <laughs> in the body. Uh, and, I mean, again, we don't, you know, how to look after our brains is not very well taught. Yeah. And there's, there's, all, there's no doubt that if you want to have the, your longest life possible, but also the healthiest life possible, because none of us want to be old and infirm. We want to be old and healthy. I want to be, you know, still climbing up, you know, still hopping in cold water in Mount Cook when I'm 100. Mm. Um, well, if we do that, we need to uh, concentrate on a healthy brain in particular. I mean, the data is now that 50% of people by the age of 85 will have some form of dementia. Well, that's not a very good statistic. No. And the eye is the visible part of the brain. So you're at the front door in terms of helping people look after their health. Because if you're looking after the health of your brain, the principles are, there's not, there's not principles for the heart and principles, we, don't, we want to get away from that. It's where we've gone medicine, that, mm. that we would chop the body up into little bits, but it's not. But the same underlying principles for the health of your heart or preventing cancer um, or not getting liver disease are the same ones as looking after the health of your brain. And you are the expert on the entryway to the health of the brain. Um, and I think that gives you a great opportunity to help people on all levels. And one of the things we absolutely know that you are not going to be able to access your neocortex in your brain if it's full of toxins. Mm. Now the brain is 60% fat. That's a clue for us. Where do we store toxins in the body? Mm. In fat. So you've got a great opportunity of helping people understand the concept of detoxification which is critical for our health, mm. health, which is not done well in medicine, despite the President's report showing that cancer is caused by environmental toxins. The President's report, available online, that Barack Obama commissioned when he first got into the President, and his experts went out and came back and said cancer is caused by environmental toxins. And we know environmental toxins get stored in fat, and we know that the brain is 60% fat. So you've got this wonderful opportunity of helping people understand the concept of detoxification, and you can't access your neocortex if it's full of toxins. Mm. So where do you go if you can't access your neocortex? You go back to the Tyrant King brain. What is the Tyrant King brain interested in? It's interested in having sex, it's interested in conquest, and fighting, and uh, running, and uh, which is kind of where the world is at the moment. It's not interested in love. Might be interested in a shag, mm. but it's not interested in heart-to-heart -heart love. Um, that's the neocortex. And if the neocortex is full of toxins, you go back to your tyrant king brain and uh, worry about fighting and, and who's, you know, the front page of the newspaper, who's screwing who. And, mm -hmm. you know, so you have this great opportunity to help people understand the concept of detoxification, which is minimize our exposure to toxins and accelerate the removal from the body. And you've got a great opportunity with diet because as we just said, 60% of the brain is fat. What's mainly the fat? Well, it's mainly DHA. Mm. Where does that come from? Seafood. Mm. What else do you get from eating salmon? Well, you get um, lots of tryptophan. Mm. What does tryptophan become? Uh, tryptophan becomes okay. serotonin. What does serotonin become? Melatonin. Hello, back to our discussion on the brain health again. So even if you as an optometrist go, okay, Look, okay, get people to understand that concept. You've got to detoxify your brain. Here's some ways of detoxifying. And you've got to feed your brain good fats. Because not only when you feed your brain good fats are you rebuilding the structure because 60% of the brain is fat, you're also giving the right fuel for the neocortex to mm. run on. And if they're just having sugar, you're just running on your turret king brain. So it all comes back to the same principles. And you, as an optometrist, or it doesn't matter if you're a physiotherapist or, you know, uh, whatever health field you're in, you've got this opportunity in your area to expand out into the governing principles for every organ of the body. Yours is a perfect one because people can see it. Yeah. You can see it. You can. It, it's pretty funny with the eyes. You can actually see the brain, yeah. and you know, it's it's full of 
not only and we know the same structure the same biochemistry for the aim eye is the same as the brain because your retina is full of dha yeah. which is the fat is another link in the quilt you know it's full the dha is the fat which is in the highest concentration in the retina and it's the dhea which converts the light signal to the electrical signal which tells our brain what time it is yeah. when we should be sleeping not sleeping and it's the it's the infrared light in the morning that you are sitting uh, you and i are sitting uh, in front of now at the harvest in northern new south wales which is both of ours one of our favorite places um, and that infrared light on our eye now is being converted by dha into an electrical signal which is going to our suprachiasmatic nucleus in our brain which is telling our brain what time it is that it's morning time and we should start producing melatonin and people go well that's rubbish melatonin is excreted at night well it's excreted at night but you've got to start making it and we start making it now by being exposed to this infrared light so if we're not getting enough dha in our diet then we're not uh getting the electrical signal to start making the melatonin so we're eating all the salmon to get our tryptophan mm. to make our um serotonin to keep us happy and we're making as well as getting happy we're making melatonin um, and if we're not getting the dha and we're not getting the infrared light we're not getting any of those signals so you know and if people just understood that the, the the importance of getting infrared light the importance of getting some seafood in the diet and the importance of sleeping well all of which is optometry 101 if they're not getting that then all the health's going to go down the goober so just but just even if you get to persuade people that then you've made an enormous way, way enormous contribution to their health yeah, so much, so much to dive into on that. Like I was listening to a, it's the Diet Doctor podcast, and so his, Brett Sher is a cardiologist, but he calls himself a low-carb cardiologist, was talking with a nutrition, low-carb nutrition researcher, and that was, you know, you've got to get people from um, being unaware of it to being curious about their health. And so that's where I'd take the step in that, you know, you said you can show them the brain and yeah. The, thing I, the thing I love about optometry is having a retinal photo because they say, see that thing there, the optic nerve, that's the start of your brain. Yeah. And actually the retina is still, still the yeah. start of the brain. And then you said about um, detoxification and they say, well, what causes macular degeneration? And it's, well, the retina needs to get built no matter which way. Now, if your omega ratio is 40 to 1, it's going to build it with these hydro hydrolyzed Omega sixes, no matter what, and, and what are they going to tell their immune system that this is a little bit foreign, this is a little bit funny, and this message isn't going to work a little bit more. You're going to have more oxidation. The pigmented epithelium beneath it is going to struggle. It's going to be working overtime, and then so then you're going to get accumulation of this waste, and then that's going to block the nutrition to the retina. The retina is either going to try and survive and get new blood vessels because it needs more oxygen, or it's going to give it up, and, and you're going to get dry macular degeneration yep. and wasting. Yeah. And interesting, you said about toxins are stored in the fat, and, and again, I listen to a lot of things, and um, Rob Wolf was talking about how you can end up getting sick when you lose lose weight, and, and lots of people, when they lose fat and lose weight, they'll have a period of, of illness, and Keegan Smith highlighted that quite well last year. He was on a mission just because, to, to highlight the, the fact that you can be at such a low body fat percentage, but he got sick, and I said to him, you know, that was probably that last little bit of fat that you had holding on to those toxins and you know you didn't have the, the fat stores in the immune system to deal with it and you got sick and he's like yeah i think that was the case so do you see that when people start to lose fat they, they go through a period of sickness and do you think that's oh, partly yeah. what why they give up as well they feel a little bit average yes absolutely uh i think there's so many places to go with that um two things one or well, three things Oh, let me give me the first one. There, there's no doubt to get a reward in life, it comes with some pain. pain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you go to the gym and you don't feel a bit achy afterwards, <laughs> you probably haven't worked hard enough. But you and I have also been to the gym when we've run, done far too many squats because we've been a little bit too enthusiastic and haven't been able to walk the next day too much. Yeah. So there's a sweet spot in life for everything, really. And so when you're when you're losing weight or fasting mm. which is probably a more important discussion because fasting is the science around fasting now is extraordinary um you're going to feel a bit grim mm. 
for a couple of days, a couple of weeks. And there might be a number of reasons for that. One, you might be getting, you know, some candida, uh, excessive candida destruction, which will make you feel terrible. Uh, and two, you're also having to change your fuel source from sugar to fat. Mm. Because, you know, you and I have got a lot of calories stored in mm. our body as fat. And we can survive for a long time. Uh, on our fat stores, but if your car engine is just used to sh uh, burning sugar, processed carbohydrates as a fuel source, it's lost its ability to burn fat. So you suddenly switch over from flip, flick the switch, going from burning sugar for energy to burning fat for sugar. That fat burning engine, if it's been switched off for the last 20 years, is going to struggle a little bit when it starts. So, so and the third one, as you said, was relief of to release of toxins. So when you start embracing fasting as part of your lifestyle yes you're going to get destruction of microbes in the body which you're out of balance with you're going to struggle because you haven't your body's forgotten how to burn fat for fuel and thirdly you're also going to start releasing toxins from the fat cells you break down all of those things are a good thing to go through yeah. but yeah there might be a little bit of pain and it's just important to let people know that when they start out that there might be one or two weeks of feeling worse before they start feeling better again. Mm. Uh, um, topic I brought up a bit is, you know, veganism tends to be, you know, a similar fast and people feel great and then deteriorate because they're lacking nutrients. And um, I heard Pete Evans talk about how he went through four years of being vegan and that's what happened to him. He felt great for six months to a year and then felt absolutely terrible and then he thought he was really going to die. Yeah. And then he changed to being paleo keto esque and felt average for a little while and then it's just continued to feel better and better and better yeah. and I guess that's and, and you said about and, and I think you know I've said this many times love him or hate him Jordan Peterson put out that anything worth doing is going to be painful and, and are we too soft <laughs> are we ready for the quick fix or do we want to change our life and, and be long longevity you know that's where you'd love your medicine to go, isn't it? Longevity. Longe we well, are yeah, longevity plus, um, you know, lots of energy as well. Mm. As I said, you don't want to be infirm and old. You want to be advanced in your years, but still having tons of energy, still mm. living a very passionate, energetic life. That's my plan. Mm. Um, so the other topic, back to the sleep that I wanted to get at, and um, you mentioned Matthew Walker before. He He's not ready to definitively say that CBD is going to help you sleep. He's very, he's very encouraged because he said that THC will inhibit your REM sleep, but CBD doesn't appear to. He said that CBD appears to help you get into sleep faster, which is beneficial because you have a longer period of sleep. And so he can't yet see a downside, but he's, he's conservative in that he's a scientist, he's not willing to put his hat on it, and you know, plenty of things will flip with more information. But, you know, the anecdotes out there, you know, I spoke with someone that went to both Afghanistan and, and Iraq and six times over, back to the fight or flight brain, he's found that the CBD has helped him sleep and has helped his anxiety and the two may be linked. Um, is there anything that you've seen in practice yet? And, and, and could you talk a little bit about prescribing within Australia? Okay. Well, I mean, you, there's a good point there. The difference between theory and practice mm. Um, you know, you can read online that coffee enemas are dangerous for you. <laughs> well, I've done a coffee enema four times a week for the last 15 years. Yeah. Uh, it, you, saying coffee enemas is dangerous is a bit like saying that using a dinner fork at night is dangerous because you might, might poke it into your eye and enucleate, enucleate your eyeball mm. onto your dinner plate. Okay. Well, yes, that would be bad. <laughs> it's certainly possible, but in like 5,000 years of dinner fork use, it hasn't happened yet. So I, I, people who are saying that coffee enemas are dangerous have never done one in their life. Mm -hmm. um, and you will find, too, that there's the, there's the science and then there's the practice. And I'm not sure exactly what the science is about CBD and sleep, but I can tell you, having prescribed a ton of it to people, that almost universally their sleep improves um, dramatically. Uh, and the other thing, interesting, the science is about coming out now about CBD and um, I was just reading an article last night about CBD and brown fat mm -hmm. where that CBD now appears to 
attached to its two receptors and start converting white fat to brown fat. And as you and I both know, white fat is where we store triglycerides uh, for use as a fuel source. Just many of us have got too much storage. Our superannuation fund is, <laughs> is bursting at the seams. Uh, whereas brown fat uh, is brown because it's full of mitochondria and brown fat produces energy and heat. So the more brown fat we can have versus white fat, the better. White fat is about storing energy and predict, predict it's, a, it's a buffer, it's a, a safety if we you know, fall over, our visceral organs are covered with, with uh, white fat. But it's brown fat which gives us our energy. Um, and so converting white fat to brown fat is a good idea for most of us. And CBD has now been shown by interactions with its 1 and 2 receptors to increase the browning of white fat. So not only does it improve your sleep, it also appears to improve your metabolism as well. And of course, the flow-on effect from more brown fat in terms of, because brown fat produces energy by burning fat. So brown fat burns fat, white fat stores fat. So the metabolic flow-on effect in terms of diabetes and uh, mm. the flow-on effect from diabetes control is profound when we talk about white fat and brown fat. So yes, I think CBD is, uh, in my experience of now prescribing it a lot to patients, is that it definitely absolutely helps with uh, sleep and therefore we go back to our discussion on sleep mm. and absolutely it helps metabolism because of the white fat to brown fat conversion. I mean, those are two pretty good. When you look on the flow effect from those two things, one, my blood sugar control and therefore my insulin levels and my leptin levels and, um, and also uh, my mel what we, our discussion about melatonin mm. and sleep. I mean, the effect of CBD therefore is profound. And the good news about Australia is that even though we got off to a slow start, the prescribing of it now is relatively easy. I'm getting the, if, if you have the right indications, I think there are five indications now mm -hmm. for its prescription. If you don't have those indications, it's very hard to get. Right. But if you do have those indications, which I think are from memory, uh, epilepsy, palliative care, uh, profound nausea from chemotherapy and chronic pain unrelieved by other pain reliefs. If you've got any of those indications, you can get an approval in 24 hours now. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very easy to get as long as the forms are filled out appropriately. So accessing it is for those indications in Australia has now become very easy. Of course, accessing it for outside those indications remains very difficult. Yeah, I had a concussion patient the other day and he's going to see one of the ophthalmologists and I asked which he described it from, but then again, it's, he's not technically in chronic pain and he doesn't have epilepsy from the head injury. But, you know, where's the, where's the line? Where do you think? Well, it's a very blurred line, really. Yeah. The, the uh, you know, chronic pain is, is a subjective symptom, not an object. It's, I can't measure somebody's chronic pain. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a bit, that, that, that is a blurry area mm -hmm. um, about about where chronic pain is. Yeah, and where's, where's epilepsy in terms of a brain injury? Is it, you, you know, like for him, he can't fuse his eyes anymore, or he can't concentrate, he can't remember stuff. So he doesn't have a fit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And then, there's, you know, you see plenty of ex-policemen who have gone through stress and head injuries and now have epilepsy. And, you know, is, is it a, just a matter of the spectrum, you know, that things, things have gone that far that now they have a fit? Yeah. Um, when you said about melatonin being protective for heart disease, protective for cancer, it, it started a thought in my head. In uh oh, yeah, no, this came out of something that the NHS is very good at, and that's just finding data. And they looked at um, five year mortality on non diabetics, diabetics on, on metformin, and um, diabetics on down the road who obviously are not. They've got to reduce mortality uh, because they have that chronic insulin release it and of often dosage from exogenous insulin. Um, and that the diabetics on metformin alone had a better mortality. And that goes somewhere, and, and that's why people are um, also taking berberine, and that they might be able to, through the cytochrome C, is that right? In the, in the membrane of, of the mitochondria, it can improves the flux 
of um, of ions through through the mitochondria and make it work better, and therefore they're more metabolic metabolically healthy. Is it's a very very complex thought you've had. Yeah. We're just sitting in there on this well, Sunday, there was, Sunday morning on no. your porch, going, <laughs> "Let me have a." What am I? Well, I'm looking at the beach. I'm down at Angels Beach. <laughs> I'm, uh, I've, I'm just, uh, it's, I'm nice and relaxed. I'll have, I'll do some thinking. You came up with that. That's very impressive. Well, it's just, it's just your your melatonin improves those cancer, heart disease, and and diabetes. Yep. And then that's the same thing they find that it has a protective aspect for cancer, heart disease, and of course diabetes is what it, what it's prescribed for. Yep. Is that where melatonin is working on the cytochrome C and making the mitochondria work better? Or well, it's one of its roles. Yeah, one of its, it's roles. You know, I've, I've written countless articles about the benefit of melatonin on your mitochondrial function. Mm. I mean, it's critical. Great, it's critical. So then, with supplementation for sleep, how long can you do that for before it's resistant? Supplement melatonin. Melatonin. Well, I think that's a critical thing. Is you don't want to supplement melatonin. Right. You want you want you can measure melatonin levels. Although I don't think I don't know how accurate that is. Uh, one of the things about testing in medicine is we're using blood and saliva, mm. but I don't think that necessarily represents what's going inside our brains. I mean, we know that for you know even with folate, you know you can measure folate levels in the blood in people with epilepsy and they're normal, but then you measure folate level, levels in their cerebral spinal fluid surrounding the brain and spinal cord and it's very low because they have some sort of problem with getting the folate from their blood to their to the air around the brain where it's critical so just because levels in the brain and the blood are fine doesn't necessarily mean that their levels are fine in the area that you need them to be used by so you can measure melatonin levels but uh, i think probably you know getting knowing that you're getting adequate good healthy sleep is probably a much better uh test of your melatonin levels and then if you're supplement, if you have to supplement melatonin, there is something wrong in your system. It's a bit the same thing with vitamin D. I don't suggest people take vitamin D supplements because if you're low in vitamin D, it means you're low in sunlight, and you get a million benefits from sunlight. Vitamin D is just one of them. So, so a vitamin D test is a measure of am I getting enough sunlight? <laughs> and if it's low, you are not getting enough sunlight. There are other reasons why you might have low vitamin D, but for general, for most of us, it's because of the lives we live now, we're not getting enough sunlight. Uh, your gallbladder function can often... Uh, if I see people with very low levels of vitamin D and they're getting lots of sun, there's usually a problem with fat absorption and their gallbladder function and stuff like that. But for general, for most of us, if you're low in vitamin D, it means you're not getting enough sunlight. And some people see me and say, oh, I get tons of sunlight. I say, when? Oh, when I'm out walking. Well, what are you wearing when you're walking? I'm wearing my tracksuit. Well, you're not getting sun because you've got to get it on your skin, obviously. So the big thing to remember about low vitamin D is if you're low in vitamin D, it means you're low in sunlight, and sunlight has a million benefits, and you're missing out on those. Plus, in Australia, you know, we have very good... Nobody should have to pay for sunlight in Australia. And the same thing with melatonin. If your melatonin levels are low, it is because you're... Your uh, the system for producing melatonin is wrong. That might mean you've got a gut problem that you need to fix, because you and therefore you're not making enough serotonin. And maybe that your diet is wrong. It may be that your exposure to artificial light and electromagnetic frequencies is excessive, and you're switching off your melatonin. So you don't, what I don't want people to do is looking in a screen all day under artificial lights, smashing the melatonin, and then going, okay, well I can fix this by taking some melatonin, because you're you're avoiding you're neglecting all the damage, the other damage that has been done by that situation, or my diet is insufficient. I'm not getting enough uh, tryptophan in my diet uh, to produce the melatonin, or my microbiome is completely stuffed, so I'm not uh, making enough serotonin to get converted to melatonin. So it's a clue. Now, you could use melatonin short term. I have no problem with that. Uh, I have a really good friend who's a flight attendant, and mm. she... Uh, uses melatonin to reconfigure her rhythm when she gets back from overseas travel. That's an appropriate use of melatonin. But to rely on it every day is a mistake because you have got to find out why I'm not making enough melatonin. Mm -hmm. Life is expensive enough these days. Mm -hmm. The number of bills we've got is extraordinary compared to you know how our parents were when they grew up in New Zealand. So again, you don't want to be spending money on sunlight and melatonin um, 
vitamin D and melatonin when you can make these things adequately yourself. And this thing, again, it's the, it's the, old, the old adage of the flashing red light on the car dashboard. Mm. When the red light starts flashing, you don't just switch off the red light. You go, holy shit, I better work out why this red light's flashing. Mm -hmm. And same thing, um, low melatonin, low vitamin D is a flashing red light, but you're not getting enough sunlight and that, you know, maybe your diet's wrong or your gut's wrong or your exposure to blue light is excessive and you should take pay attention to that mm. and say, thanks very much, melatonin, for alerting to me the fact that I've got a problem. Um, so bringing us back to our tyrant brain and our sympathetic nervous system and uh, what we've been experiencing in our household, that cortisol rush in the middle of the night. You've got a newborn baby. Yeah, that cortisol rush in the middle of the night that then blocks everything. Yeah. What can you do about it? Yeah. Well, or, and do you think there's a protective side to the love that you get from a newborn? The answer is yes. I would think so, yes. We'd hope so. Yes. Yes. And the same thing with alcohol. You know, there's a big debate about what the appropriate level of alcohol is. And... Um, you know, you can debate the science on that all the time. But I always say, you know, if you get, let's say, let's say, this is not necessarily the case, but let's say that all alcohol is not good for you, any amount of alcohol is not good for you. That's not necessarily the case, but let's say that is. Then, um, but if you're sitting on your back porch, say you're sitting on your back porch on Friday night with Alex, your mm. lovely wife, and you're having, both having a glass of red wine, mm. And she's having a glass of red wine, and you're sitting there having a glass of water, going, that freaking Dr. Emerson told me that one glass of wine is damaging my health, <laughs> rocking back in your in your rocking chair, going, I'm freaking miserable while your wife's incredibly happy. Sure, you've got plus five points from not having that glass of wine, but you've lost 50 for being miserable. Whereas Alex is sitting there, maybe, maybe she's getting minus five points for uh, having a glass of wine, maybe. Um, but she's got 50 points because she's incredibly happy and at peace. Yeah. And, you know, number one thing in, life, in, in a health regime is mindset. And mindset is about know your purpose, have some sort of prayer slash meditation process. And by that, I mean be at peace. Yeah. Now, for me, my prayer slash meditation process is, as you know, hiking into the wilderness and finding a waterfall to get into. That might be some other person's complete misery. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, that's where I find my peace and that's where I communicate with the universe, if you like. It's where I maximise what they call the LEF, the uh, luminous energy field around our bodies. Cool. That's where I maximise that. And the third part of mindset is being positive. So what Alex is doing by sitting on her back porch... Uh, with her wonderful husband having a glass of wine is maximizing her that might be her prayer and meditation process that's where she, find, she finds peace mm -hmm. now of course as in as in everything there's a sweet spot mm -hmm. can't sit on your back porch and drink three bottles of wine and go geez i'm really peaceful now <laughs> that's <Now you're> drunk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. it's going to come with consequences the next day yeah. but you know so you know balance and harmony is and it get back to what do we call uh, hormesis? Yeah, hormesis. You know, and that, yeah, that definitely comes under hormesis. Hormesis is such an amazing strategy where the concept of hormesis is that um, what's bad for us in large amounts, mm. like any stress, is probably good for us in small amounts, and also bad for us in not enough. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's all about hormesis. Is all about you don't want to live a completely stressful, stress-free life. Mm. You'd be miserable. There'd be no growth. Mm. Nobody wants that. But so you want a little bit of stress in your life, and that stress for Homo sapiens is traditionally short-term rather than long-term. We got chased by a saber-toothed tiger for a while, and then we went back and sat around the fire and, and yahooed about and it. And yahooed and told everybody our, our amazing <laughs> uh, feat in escaping the saber-toothed tiger, and um, sat around the fire. Uh, but we didn't get chased 12 hours a day. And, and that's where our lifestyles have changed so much. And this is what we all need to look at because, I mean, just about everybody's now working 12-hour work days. And then you've got to find, what do they call it now? The side hustle. Mm -hmm. You've got to develop a side hustle. When you say, when you say to the authorities, oh, I don't have enough money to pay the bills into the week, they say you'll get a side hustle. So that means you get home, you know, 
you play with your kids for an hour and then you go up to your room to, you know, try and sell something on Amazon or drive for Uber or something. I mean, since my dad was a probation officer in Nelson, you yeah. know, and he bought a house for $15,000 and my mum was a school t- primary school teacher and she um, stopped working when we were growing up to look after us. And, you know, my dad... And where were your grandparents as well? They were, they were in right? Christchurch. Yeah. Christchurch in New Plymouth. So, um, you know, dad worked as a probation, probation officer and, and paid off the house in four or five years. I mean, you know, and we had one television in the corner yeah. uh, of the house with, I think New Zealand had one channel then when I was growing up. Um, no such thing as a mobile phone or an internet. And, uh, you know, he worked an eight hour day and paid the house off in four or five years. Well, good luck doing that now. Mm. You know, you, many, I don't know how my daughters are going to buy a house. Now my, my oldest daughter's just started work as a primary school teacher and she works, you know, incredible hours. Mm. Whole thing about, you know, <laughs> and I seeing how hard it work, you know, we always, you know, I have a huge amount of respect for teachers now. Mm. You know, everybody kind of, they still, they suffer from this concept. That everybody thinks they finished work at three and they'd have all these holidays all year. Well, she finished work at three, but then she's still working to nine o'clock, marking and planning the day, the, the, the hours the next day. And um, she works on most of the holidays getting stuff ready. And she's got a, she works at a private school, so she's expected to, to buy most of the equipment in the classroom. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm talking to her about, we're well, going to have to find a way to get a side hustle going. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, here's my 22 year old daughter working her ass off already, got to try and find a side hustle. It's stress to the max. I mean, that's not good for any of us. And her sleep's getting disrupted because she's got to stay up on her laptop all night, getting the, the classroom ready. And, and the lives that we've developed for ourselves are so far. I mean, they're not even in the paradigm that we should be living. It's a new paradigm and it's destroying us. And we need to find some way of fixing this because otherwise we're all, you know, 85, 50% of us by 85 got some sort of dementia. And when you look at the statistics on illness, it's just phenomenal what, how well, how the amount of illness in society now, it's manageable by medications. But, you know, some people on, a lot of people are on at least 10 prescription medications now. Well, Something's gone wrong on our shift. I mean, really, you can't look at that data and go, okay, one in two of us are going to die of cancer, one in two of us are going to die of heart disease, and most of us are going to have dementia by the time we're 80. And good luck if you're a man still having your prostate gland. Yeah. You know, something's gone very wrong on our shift, on our watch. And we need to fix it. When you bring up prostate gland, you know, you look at the postmortem data and was it 98% have know it's grown it's grown when does that become cancer problem going to kill you go elsewhere what, what do you think the influence of that do you know if, if that's part of our history that people got prostate cancer or do you think again no i mean you look at any of i mean you go back and look at any of the data you know western western a price data yeah. you know and you know you look at uh you know uh, Alberto Velodo. Uh, oh, cool. yeah, he's, he's fascinating guy. He's an anthropologist. Anthrop- anthropologist. Yeah. Anthropologi- anthropologist. Yeah. There we go. Anthropologist. <laughs> Semantics. He's an anth- <laughs> exactly. He's an anth- We're Kiwis, it doesn't matter. He's an anthropologist, and they sent him into. They sent him into the Amazon jungle as a as a re- as a recent postgraduate, uh, and said, "Okay, we want you to go in there and find the next." great cancer drug or the next great heart disease drug and he was in there for months researching the, all the herbs in the Amazon and they, he came out after a couple of years and they said great what did you find and he said nothing <laughs> uh, there, is a, there isn't anything there but they don't have that concept you go into the Amazon and you and I were both talking about a bit of a sidetrack about that Joe Rogan podcast with Graham Hancock mm. which was fascinating the fact that we there were ancient civilizations in the Amazon, which have been buried, mm. which they're now just discovering from a hundred thousand years ago, that we didn't need, know of, that were sophisticated, very advanced civilizations that we haven't even we don't even understand yet what they were doing. That have since then been overgrown by the Amazon. Now, 
discovering with this LIDAR technolo technology we've got now, we can use radar to look mm. under the ground and find these ancient civilizations that have been buried under a rainforest uh, that, that we know nothing about yet. Um, and so, yeah, oh, no, where was it? Alberto Veloda, so in the Amazon, found nothing. But he said that, that people don't understand that concept. You go and say, okay, what do you use when you get cancer? And they go, well, what's that? What do you use when you heart? Well, what's that? They don't get these illnesses. And Weston A. Price found the same. Mm. He found the same in these traditional populations living with natural light, relatively stress-free existent, eating a local seasonal diet, didn't get these chronic degenerative diseases. Uh, and, um, you know, again, I, I first got interested in herbal medicine when I read a book the, the, I've always been fascinated with the Native American mm -hmm. culture. I actually went and you know spent three days with the Apache in Arizona, learning about some of the herbs and the way they used to live their life. But I first got interested in that when I read a book, the the herb the herbs of the Cherokee, cool. and of course, when when you know with the frontier, the Western frontier came, and you know eventually, the new population of the Americas went to the Cherokee and said, okay. We're fascinated by herbs. What herbs do you use for this disorder? They said, "What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. We don't understand that concept of medicine. We use these herbs all the all the time to stay healthy." So, if you're living in the Amazon, you're drinking cat's claw tea all day. You're having pal darko. You're having all of these phytonutrient rich um, plant foods constantly to keep your gut biome healthy and keep your immune system healthy uh, and to switch on longevity genes and to, uh, we, we, they don't know that. Mm. Nobody in the Amazon knew that their diet and their lifestyle was boosting their mitochondria, was turning on longevity genes, was developing pluripendent stem cells. They didn't know that. They just knew, hey, we don't get these degenerative diseases. They died of trauma, they died of acute infections occasionally, you know, particularly if they weren't exposed to it, you know, smallpox devastated mm. them. That's what they died of, but they didn't have these chronic degenerative diseases. And the evidence is they lived a very long time without these diseases. So there is no doubt that if we adopt these health principles, we shouldn't be talking about what's the cure for prostate cancer. Because mm. if, what, what I can't remember the data, but as you said, when you're 80, I mean, a huge amount of men have got some detectable prostate cancer. We should be saying, how do we change our lives? What are we doing wrong that we're getting prostate cancer? And how do we change our lives so that we never get prostate cancer? No, you don't. don't you don't want to be asking, what's a great herb to take for my prostate cancer? <laughs> you know, but but you know, how old are you now? About Thirty. Thirty. Yeah, no, probably by the age of forty, you've got to start thinking, okay, what am I going to do for a prostate health strategy, yeah. but that's no different to the same strategy you're going to use for your lung strategy or your brain strategy or your heart disease strategy. That's the beauty about this. When you understand the fundamentals of health, the fundamentals of how the body works, and that's my great passion now in medicine and science is marrying together what science is now showing us about universal principles that we've been adopted since day one, which we have now moved away from and forgotten, but you can't. You can't. You can. You can adapt and survive, but you cannot move away from fundamental principles. Mm. Um, we talked about things that are free, and that's the sun and vitamin D. And then there's the great debate: Do you stop yourself getting skin cancer with sunblock, or do you mitigate your sun exposure and, and be diligent about how you get sun exposure and prevent the rest of the cancers? <laughs> yes. Well, that was the thing, wasn't? It? That's why you know we we. The slip slop slap campaign disappeared because you know we found that yeah there was a few less skin cancers but the rate of other cancers went up dramatically because everybody got low vitamin d so the science now about vitamin d and prevention of cancer is overwhelming um, but also interestingly the data was very clear too that that particularly with melanoma it's very clear that it's not long-term sun exposure that causes it it's short-term exposure of the sun Getting, you know, you and I, I don't know what you were like, but yeah. I grew up in Wellington. I'm Wellington, Chicago, I got burnt. <laughs> you, had to, you had to get, a, when you were 15, you had to get a tan in summer. Yeah, no, it's a good. Yeah, you have a cargo. We started then, at white. You, you, <laughs> might get a, you might get one day of summer. No, no. Now, you get one day in summer, we're going to get some good sun. you got to be out on that terrace. And we all went out there and just turned into lobsters. 
Your mum yeah. was talking about coco- the beach throwing of coconut oil. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, was, we didn't get out. We just got burned. <laughs> and that's the data that shows it's that short-term intense getting burnt, which does the most damage to the skin. But the other thing, which is slightly contentious, but I think the data is very clear, is that if you're not getting a lot of sunlight, you're getting a lot of artificial light. Mm. So a lot of the data now is starting to suggest that perhaps it's not the, the short-term exposure to sunlight. Because you're getting short-term exposure to sunlight, you're getting long-term exposure to artificial light. That it's actually the artificial light which is causing all these skin problems, the uh, LED lights and fluorescent lights, um, and not so much sunlight. That being said, you know, there are guidelines with the sun which is don't get burnt. You know, you, nobody, I don't think anybody now would debate that that you want to aim for a healthy tan all year round mm. without getting burnt as the ideal way um, of getting adequate vitamin D and also looking after the health of our skin. Yeah. And of course, you know, when you have a phytonutrient rich diet because your diet is full of healthy fats and phytonutrient plant foods, there are a lot of phytonutrients in those things, you know, even things like green tea, which have been shown categorically to prevent against skin cancer. So if you're, if you're sensible about your sun exposure and you've got a phytonutrient diet rich in healthy fats and phytonutrients, your, your risk of skin cancer goes down dramatically. Um, and more sort of anecdote is people going to a low-carb, a paleo, seasonal, you know, healthy fat diet where the ratio is more in check, don't tend to get sunburnt as easily. Oh, absolutely. And so going back to the macular degeneration, your body will put those fats down if, if it needs to or it doesn't and if it's more pro-inflammatory on the balance yep. you're going to get a more reactive yep. skin would you say? Yes and the other thing too about the skin and the sun is that there is no doubt that infrared light primes the skin for ultraviolet light later on the day. Right. So it's the ultraviolet light which turns burning. You and I can sit outside and you know from 7 to 8 in the morning uh, we're not going to get burnt. Mm. Um, but that exposure to infrared light in the morning primes the skin to make us less reactive to the ultraviolet light later in the day. And the problem is we all work 12 hour days, we've got to dash down at lunchtime mm. uh, and get our sun exposure and we haven't been primed by the infrared light. So one of the ways of minimising the damage from the ultraviolet light midday is to make sure you're out there getting the early light as well, which primes the skin and gets it ready. Makes your skin much less reactive. I got to the stage when I was on the farm where I didn't need to, even during midsummer, I didn't need to use any sunscreen because I was out with my shirt off, you know, from seven in the morning working on the farm, you know, to late on the day. I didn't need to use sunscreen at all because my, the infrared light in the early morning had got my skin ready for the ultraviolet later on. Now, had I not done that and dashed out to dig the garden, you know, between, you know, 12 and two, I, I would have ended up, you know, in hospital with severe burns. So that is also critical. So having a good diet full of phytonutrients um, minimising exposure to artificial light and getting the infrared light in the morning to prime your skin is uh, is a good way to avoiding skin damage. Mm. Probably some more circular logic. Vitamin D, melatonin, and then melanin. There, is there any circle going on there with, with melanin and melatonin? Or I don't know the answer. Don't know that. the answer. No, it's all right. Um, so we are at now with living in the Tweed. It's not the farm, it's not the city. Where are you at now? <laughs> I am in, uh, yeah, the Tweed. I'm in northern New South Wales. Um, it was a tough decision for me uh, to decide, and hopefully this will be long term. I still get homesick for Nelson. But my family here, now I've got two daughters here, and they were born in Australia, so it's unlikely they'll ever want to live in New Zealand. They love visiting and going to Wanaka with my daughter in June. Um, but northern New South Wales, for me, is the pick of Australia. Mm. Uh, and it very much reminds me of Nelson. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 30 minutes drive from Byron Bay, which I find you know, a spiritual area for me. And you know, like, like in Sedona, where there's no doubt there's energy vortices mm-hmm. in Sedona, whichever you're quite sceptical about until you get to Sedona yeah. in Arizona, and you go, holy hell, there is something amazing here. Uh, you know, same thing with the energy in, in northern New South Wales. I think it's to do with the, the amount of obsidian channels under the ground, they right. say, in Byron. And I feel really good here, and it reminds me of, uh, 
Nelson and I've got a small property now uh, where I'm growing most of my own food and uh, I got access to some extraordinary geography and, and waterfalls and cold water that I like to spend my time doing. Although I was in the water yesterday and all that was cold, you know, well, in six weeks' time I'm going to be in Mount Cook in Wanaka in, in glacier water. Mm. It's, it is going to be a bit of a, a jump for me. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy in uh, this area now and this will be long term. And it's easy for me to get to back, back to Nelson when I want to. Sure short plane trip and I'm back to the other area that I feel very comfortable. There's no doubt there are places in the world where I feel like I'm home. You've probably got the same yeah. thing. I just have to fly into a plane in Nelson and I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing I, I suddenly feel like I'm home. I can't explain it. I can't explain it. But it's just that feeling of peace and comfort that you get when you're in that area that you feel like home. And ultimately the home is for me is where my where my family is and my daughters are. But I do get that geographical feeling to it of great peace when I'm in an area that I really like. And that's what I posted the other day, you know, whilst it's been hard doing parenting on our own, we've been in a sanctuary, you know, and there's a colloquialism that you come here to heal or be healed and I've probably done a bit of both and um, being able to touch nature, get barefoot on the sand and yeah. in the surf and come into places like the hinterland and, and just see greenery even when there's a drought, it's just incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think you're going to look back very fondly on your time yeah. in northern New South Wales. Uh, and the good news is, I mean, you know, it's a three-hour flight now for you. It's a piece of cake to get back. We know some people. <laughs> What's that, sorry? We know some people. <laughs> yeah, you know some people. That's always really helpful. <laughs> no, awesome. Um, you know, your, your first time on the podcast was hugely successful as, as far as the numbers of my podcast go. Um, and, and I think that's because... You, you take a, a full look at things and go deep into things. Do you have any mindsets, you know, key health figure number one to, to leave us with? Well, I think, I think probably everything that we've discussed, it gets back to the mindset, doesn't it? Mm. I think, I suppose, you and I were discussing whether or not there's been a, 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 sh a shift in the general paradigm. I mean, the general paradigm of health now is that, well, drugs and surgery will save us. We don't need to worry about anything else. I mean, that was what we were promised, mm. and that hasn't really eventuated. And I think what we're hoping is that the, the population is going to start realising the answer is not there, and we need to go back to the universal, universal principles of health, where we take responsibility for it. Uh, we can't wait around for other people to direct us. We have to take responsibility for that, understand the general principles of health and the first one of that is the mindset that was be positive uh, find your peace um, and know your purpose mm -hmm. and I think that the lifestyles we're leading now have to change we have to find some way of changing the system because of the that the costs of living are going up so high and the, the the wages are not, and we have to find a way that we, we can't keep working 14 hour days with side hustles as well and expect to be healthy. We've got to look at how do we modify our lives so that we can adopt some of the universal principles of health because the drugs and surgery are not going to save us. And that, that starts off with reducing stress levels. Because if you're stressed, you're in your lizard, tyrant, king brain, and you're not in your neocortex. And, you know, you and I discussed that in the Mike Tyson podcast yeah. with Joe Rogan. Phenomenal podcast. I mean, there's a guy who is eloquent, was intelligent, passionate, and, you know, you basically, that podcast is him moving out of the, his lizard brain, his limbic brain, the fight or flight brain, which he got, well, very obvious that he got manipulated into that. But again, he recognises that and doesn't is not bitter about that because he understands that gave him a platform to be the person he is now. And it was a very, very inspiring podcast about how we can change, mm. that we are being locked into our tyrant king limbic brain, concentrating on fight, flight, feeding, uh, and not in our neocortex where we're developing... That's where the magic happens. That's where you develop the new neural pathways. That's where you turn on longevity genes. Uh, that's where you develop pluripotent stem cells. <laughs> so we've got to get out of the lizard brain, got to get into the neocortex. And the first part of that, as we said, the first part is making that decision. That's what I want to do, because mm. I'm not going to rely on drugs and surgery. I'm going to start 
focusing on that. And the first part of that, I would say, is reducing stress levels in life. Start a garden. <laughs> Start a garden. Well, that, well, that works for me. Yeah. might be misery for you. I know. It's got to find out what it is for you. As I said, uh, there are people who I could take to a freezing cold. I'm going to go and hop in uh, the Rod Roy Glacier in six right. weeks' time. Yeah. That will be very relaxing and enjoyable for me. Other people will just be the worst thing in the world. So you've got to find out what that is for you. Beautiful two-hour walk as well. Up and back. Oh, it's a stunning walk. Yeah. It's a yeah. stunning walk. Love it. Great. We'll end it there. <laughs> Awesome finish, awesome podcast, awesome conversation. Uh, Greg's an awesome man, love what he has to say. It's really cool to be in his presence and it's one of those people that conversation just keeps sparking these new areas of exploration and, and I suppose that comes from him living quite an experienced life and having explored a lot of things. And it's quite an inspiration to, to me to see someone that's keen to never stop learning and always push the boundaries and and look forward to that uh, long and healthy and um, resilient and, and vi- I don't know what the word is, a life of vitality. <laughs> yeah, he, he really wants to live every day with with great power and and also create a lasting impression and lasting influence on people in a positive way. So. Yeah, it's, it's cool that he's trying to push the paradigm when it comes to medicine and trying to get people, you know, taking responsibility. And that's why it resonates so well with the podcast. You know, some of these conversations are to try and spark us to, to think for ourselves, to take responsibility for ourselves and give us some tools so that we can, you know, not just keep thinking about it, but actually implement something that's going to make the difference going forward and improve our own lives and the lives of those that we come into contact with. Um, quite interesting there about looking at different ways that we can shape our, our world so that we're in less stress. I know right now about to move back to New Zealand, there's a number of different stresses. Uh, last Thursday, man, I was, they, were, they were big. <laughs> and whole, ironically, I was listening to Robert Sapolsky speak with Peter Atia about the influence stress has on your life and basically like a lack of sleep how much it's bad for our health and the, and the two are hugely linked especially um, as we talked about with Greg there you get that spike of cortisol it inhibits your melatonin so yeah uh, double edged sword that one and yeah uh, um, thankfully changed a few things definitely changed the mindset and and by the next day there was a massive weight on off the shoulders um, I think that's what doing things like hunting or doing things like extreme exercise teaches you, teaches you to problem solve um, and deal with stress and handle stress. And, and even though at the time it can feel heavy, know that uh, there's a great saying, this soon shall pass. Uh, this soon shall pass. It's extremely uh, necessary um, when you've got a baby. <laughs> It's great advice, and not just that. It can be applied elsewhere. Anyway, I'm rambling. This podcast is um, already long enough. It's a great one. There's plenty of gems in there, and I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to reach out um, if you have enjoyed it, if there's any questions, if, you know, if you've got another thought, if you've got more input, if you've got somebody that could uh, you know, have a conversation with me along similar lines or even something that you think I've missed and, and would be know because this is for my learning as well as yours so i'd love to talk to anybody um i've got a few people lined up for when i get back to new zealand unfortunately i don't have anything um to put out at this point over next weekend i can't imagine that'll change in the next week we've got a lot on but um i'll be back soon with another podcast so hang in tight thank you so much for listening so far um it's been wicked seeing those people who have resonated with it the audience continues to build it's hugely humbling thank you so much um, if you're on itunes leave a rating and if you've got another few seconds um, little review would be fantastic it helps get more ears out there and be sure to share it out there in text and a post um, if you're interested in exogenous ketones you just go to the show notes the website's there um, if you're in new zealand the facebook page and instagram's there send me a message, we can get you exogenous ketones, I've just put an order in for somebody 
um, today and another one on the weekend. So it's really simple, really easy for those Kiwis to get hold of it. Um, I'll just put it through uh, and, we, and we get it in your hands. Otherwise, if you're in Australia, US, Canada or East Asia, super simple. Just go into the show notes, click on the website, choose your flavour. Exogenous ketones will be at your door reasonably fast. It's a couple of days in the States uh, and, and within a week, I think, for Australia. So, yeah, awesome. Thanks again, and we'll catch you next time on the Stag Raw. Cheers.